I recall quite a lot about Chippendale. Um, I specifically recall this piano. I remember uh, stopping some people from demolishing it one day. They just kind of turned up at Chippendale House and were like, oh man, we want to destroy the piano. And I was like, fuck no, you can't destroy the piano. They weren't even locals. They had nothing really to do with the collective. They just thought they could come and do a bit of destruction on a weekday. And I, yeah, I just remember being really pissed and just thinking, Nah, <laughs> we're, not, we're not that free. <laughs> we're going to be free, but we're not, you can't destroy the instruments in the house. That's not on. We're just going to play some music and record it and put it out as a cassette and maybe play again if we were lucky. I think that's, <laughs> that's what it comes down to. But the thing was that, you know, once we released the cassette, some people heard and just thought, oh, it's just crap, it's a bunch of noise. And then once we played, it reinforced that idea that we were crap. <laughs> and we were a bunch of noise. The hall was a place that everyone met and played in, but it also had this like other quality that um, was captured in the playing. When people, play when people played well in that space, you could really tell, you know, you could, the room sounded amazing. And I don't, I mean, I've certainly played in bigger places since, but it's still that, that wonderfulness of playing in a pretty clean room that's that size with nobody in it is um, pretty special.
Chippendale House was a long time ago. And so when you say Chippendale House to an 18 year old, they go, what? Yeah. And then when you explain it, they go, oh yeah, that sounds amazing. Wouldn't that be a good thing to do? It was, um, to begin with, a collective. First and foremost, a collective of um, mostly musicians. That's how it started. It was mostly musicians and then other people came in as um, perhaps helpers in the building, but also as people who wanted to um, join the collective. It was the first one to happen here. And so it gave the next ones, um, Super 8, seeds of how to do things and how not to do things. Stuart Griffiths, Andrew Drummond and Russell Moses introduced us to the building they'd found for us in Stafford Street and what an amazing trio to 
organise all of us to do that. Um, Andrew also f found us a piano. And so they got all of us together and they basically whipped us into a, into a, a collective. I, I don't know what the, how the blood got to my head to make my hand go up and go, oh, I'll be the treasurer. <laughs> um, so I said, yes, I'd do that. And that was, uh, that was uh, trial by fire. And I never wanted to do that again after, after doing that, ever, ever. <laughs>
it was a New Year's Eve. It was with Blue Go Purple and the Verlaines, and I can't remember who else. I was one of the door people as well as playing, so that was a bit of a nightmare, and carrying around a big bag of, I think it was coins. I had just bought this beautiful dress that um, I didn't realise that as soon as I started playing that it wanted to fall off. So that was pretty <laughs> interesting um, <laughs> because, of course, um, trying whilst I was playing bass to keep the dress on. But that was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a the magic night. I loved it. It was just typical of lots of shows at Chippendale. I made some and, and held some and still hold some really great friendships from that time. Yeah. And also the knowledge that you can do it. You can't, yeah, it, it could be hard, but you still can do it. It's all, it's all doable. So my first song was Ghost Boy. That was Broken Heart just then, and this is Falling Light.
That's me. The idea of Chippendale House for me was all about what best of Dunedin really in terms of the collectivism and the spirit. This particular um, arts collective really sprang out of things that were going on earlier in the 80s. Um, Stuart Griffiths had a um, sort of some kind of art, art symposium here in about 1984 and I think that um, Alistair Goldbrace and a few others kind of were a bit inspired by that to um, carry on with this, with this whole idea of the collective and um, and of course it flowed through into the Super 8 and then into Art Cafe and so forth so they were all kind of interconnected in a way and I managed to perform my poetry at, at pretty much all of those uh, collectors back in the day. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, so I write poems about living here in Aotearoa. Been doing it for a while and I like to sort of wander around and get inspiration from different places and one of those down at the old early settlers museum looking through their um, galleries of uh, old identities and thinking about the uh, pioneers and, and um, the early settlers and um, I came up with this, it's called uh, Down the Back of the Bush Paddock. The sharp edges of tourist brochures cut to the quick, slashing away down the back of the bush paddock. King Kumara slithers from a sack of dark earth and begins to propagate his progeny down the back of the bush paddock. Most of Nauri Tonga is underwater and we live amongst its tallest peaks down the back of the bush paddock. Ladies bring a plate of butter pats or do a terrific pavlova bake or lather up a froth of rinso flakes down the back of the bush paddock. The graying of the nation sees grannies going for two dollars a kilo down the back of the bush paddock. The hydrangeas are flowering in red, white and blue for the royal the walkabout the down the back of the bush paddock. A department store is draped roof to floor, wall to wall with black wool cardigans down the back of the bush paddock. A railway station master raises his flag and blows his whistle for the Treaty of Waitangi Express down the back of the bush paddock. Tribes of possums come up trumps, a pack of bludgers on the land down the back of the bush paddock. A wandering prophet named Pakiha will eat the tongue and eyes of an enemy with the heart of a cabbage tree down the back of the bush pit. Two drongos are trying to build a replica of Mount Ruapehu out of playing cards down the back of the bush pit. Victorian outhouses get flogged off at outlandish down prices the the and sinister garden gnomes lurk down in the, the shrubbery the down the back of the bush pit. The parliamentarian with the head of a kakariki strops his beak on a kofi tree down the back of the bush paddock. A farm cinderella and an old sundowner are dancing an armistice jig to a concertina down the back of the bush paddock. Ups a daisy with the old lemon squeezer down the back of the bush paddock. A horned thumbnail dipped in tar strikes a light to standing block, setting fire to the beard of a bard down the back of the bush paddock. Enough posts to prop up the scrum, the mine, the bridge, and to build a pub for every man, woman, and child on the, the west coast the... are being milled down, the back, down the... the back of the bush paddock. Down the back of the bush paddock. Down the back of the bush paddy. Hey. My best memory is um, definitely, I, I used to play in a Sex Pistols cover band, the X Pistols, and those nights were pretty crazy. There were security problems. It was kind of out of control. I don't know if you were there, but... Um, <laughs> um, yeah, all the money from the door went missing on that night, and we don't know, who cares, it's 
40 years ago, but at the time, obviously, it, you know, it's not a good thing, but it was a great night. We had a really good time. Uh, this is called Freedom Songs of the uh, Viet Cong. Freedom Songs of the Viet Cong. It's about that age of protest and resistance, street protest. Victor Hugo at fever pitch. I may not make old bones, said he, as eight immortals were crossing the sea. But I know that wherever I may roam, and he cupped his hands like a megaphone, his face Desolate, his tears sprang on cue. I'll seek the gate of luminous virtue. And he was singing the freedom songs of the Viet Cong. He was singing the freedom songs of the Viet Cong. He was singing the freedom songs of the Viet Cong. A Ravi Shankar Raga played on the stereo And I see him there still Though it was years ago Picked out in the darkness by the floral glare A red-eyed Polaroid with shaggy hair Teeth tubes humming like a tuning fork Tripping on a tab of window panes tall Over Mekong's delta Droned bomber planes Black smoke from rice paddies Reflected flames And he was singing the freedom Songs of the Viet Cong Dust devils rose through those golden summers To clangs of the 13th floor elevators Moby grape rock, strawberry alarm clock Groovy vinyl go-go boots on the hop Ho Chi Minh's trail of gardens lay concealed Filaments from silkworm cocoons unreal Dragon clouds grew from a napalm Bodhi tree Newsreels showed monks burning for liberty As John Doe undid the name tag from his big toe Dance to Barbara Ann in our family bungalow. And he was singing the freedom songs of the Viet Cong. He was singing the freedom songs of the Viet Cong. He was singing the freedom songs of the Viet Cong. And so that idea of there was a whole lot of other activity going on around this space, 
was really uh, fascinating, and there are sort of theatre groups associated with it. I mean, it's a bit hard to recall exactly what was going on, but I just had this sense of you know, like a like a beehive, sort of a humming. Uh, um, you know, enterprise, um, and, and it was sort of everyone felt like they could do something. It was very much motivated by the, the feelings of people t who wanted to be involved, which is really good. I really liked that idea. So the idealism was pretty, pretty captivating, yeah. Oh, this is the next one. It's got music by Trevor Coleman, who's uh, I collaborated with. Um, part of the, uh, being part of the Dunedin scene, it's good to be able to have me uh, collaborate with different musicians, and um, Trevor Coleman is a uh, jazz uh, trumpeter and jazz musician who now lives in Spain, but um, before he left for Europe, um, he put together some music and, uh, uh, to one of my poems, and this is called Electric Puha, telling marketing ode. Straight up, yes people, we burn like red meat. Hope to go ape, disaster wise when wired. Your memories of President Cadillac have been retired. Now that Wildcat operators have staked out your seat. Goodyear inner tubes on the soles of their shoes. They enter singing the third world debt blues. Poison poppy economists overstuff a hot casino. Pizza vixens buy into the Great Pacific Way. Dive beneath the foam dome of a cold cappuccino. Trip the plastic fantastic like the good old days. Belzebub fires up a humongous giggle stick and plonks himself down in front of the telly. The sizzle of a couch potato turning on a spit is raising hell from beyond the gravy. Like taxi drivers don't break for a backless maxi. False memory syndrome don't fake how it feels. The magazine death mask of Princess Di unpeels some sleep-starved eyes. Caucasian rowdy caucuses who don't look or act Maori take crash courses in bar management for singles. Hand clapping to the beat of razor blade jingles. The minister without portfolio wears a flyaway toupee from Sir Robert's hair show factory. He's swinging like a soap on a rope champion. Autographs the bestseller, rivers of phlegm, and promises airbag flotation to move the nation. Joy Boy and Eco Woman relive their glorious past, pole vaulting to the top of the pantyhose charts. Here's to anonymous supermarket shelf stackers who have no marquee value so can't find backers. For capitalist plots or the state welfare funeral, spell it out with words of one syllable. Black and blue means I don't love you. Iron guts reads contain loads of hate mail and silence punctuated by gurgles of stomach gas while a stoned PM telemarkets electric puha from the beehive on wheels. A fast track racing tar to an uncritical ad mass modeling pimple ration. Don't tell me you don't know who you are. Hurdling thigh master, abdominizer, diet upsetter, smoking your computer under the nuclear umbrella. The poor recycled is clueless with no agenda. Everyone a worthy cause in search of a soft touch. The sun gun sea lamp holds the fashion victim pose too much and baroque burger ramas rococo cola kids engage in an orgasmic billion burger binge from shoe lift to facelift one triumphant turkey trot rat grows human air sticky tongue ticky cerebral cortex rot dog's leg cocked against the family tree blind spot of interchangeable identities privatized history talks an electric puha telling marketing old blue talk an electric puha telling marketing old blue talk an electric puha Calling marketing old blue. Yeah. Thank you. As I remember it, it was supposed to be, you know, trying to get the arts and you know, or music um, away from the pub scene. For some of the more extreme acts in Dunedin, if you went to some of the regular pubs, there could be problems. You know, it was a fairly conservative sort of um, environment in some places. Um, we played with, with all sorts of people, um, anybody from the chills, um, sneaky feelings, to, you know, touring, touring acts like the Instigators. I think we even played with hip singles, and we were a dirty, dirty ass little punk band. <laughs> you know, we, we didn't care, we just wanted to play. It's called uh, Hotel Pacific. Thank you. 
Fire walkers' flames flicker and the gourds of tourist skulls. Leaf shadows make pillows a charm. Garlands wear out their welcome. Mosquitoes whine like Cupid's bad dark. In the Hotel Pacific, Hotel Pacific, Hotel Pacific. Dengue fever travels by FedEx jet, but cargo cold diplomats still flee the Hotel Pacific slowly. Lizards cough beneath the floors, guitars twang from wire screen doors. In the Hotel Pacific, Hotel Pacific, Hotel Pacific. Pink cloud skims the horizon, beer froth tips on glassy lager. Viewed from the hotel veranda, the ocean does crash dive maneuvers. Low flies crawl the grubby louvers in the Hotel Pacific, Hotel Pacific, Hotel Pacific. Chewed cards of banknotes are flung, where harems of ships' sirens once sung. Private agents of secret powers suspend dreams of freedom for children who gather hibiscus flowers in the Hotel Pacific, Hotel Pacific, Hotel Pacific. Shark callers feed the fiery furnace with a chopped down forest of Jonas. And the helix of the tribe twists between the crests of firewalkers until rain starts to fall with a hiss in the Hotel Pacific, Hotel Pacific, Hotel Pacific. Hotel Pacific washed up in a shopping mall Trawls into the neon glare of it all On the beach a military band Is searching carefully for the lost cord As laughter of raindrops snorkels into sand In the Hotel Pacific Hotel Pacific Hotel Pacific Washed up in a shopping mall, Hotel Pacific. Washed up in a shopping mall. The main goal was for it was open to everybody. Anyone could come and use the space. Well, anyone, yeah, anyone. Like anyone could walk in off the street and technically become involved. So, uh, you know, with that became, there, there were difficulties with that because I mean, anyone could come off the street. And I mean, we were welcoming in that respect. In the 80s, there were a lot of art centres like that, you know, all over New Zealand, really, in the main cities, especially run by unemployed people and artists. So um, it was your classic sort of art centre. The collective thing does work, I, I guess, yeah. And, the, you know, the best things come from small groups of people working together, I think.
I think Chippendale House, the best thing about it was people saw possibility. Everyone could meet there and you'd get a cross-pollination of ideas between photographers and sculptors and musicians and it would all sort of wrap itself into one big giant thing and out of it would come these things that you would never dream of alone.
that place to stand or having a place that was outside of the ordinary where you could be slightly different so you kept on pushing the boundaries out at that particular time. As I recalled with Warwick Broadhead who was just a brilliant performer, he was gay and one of the really beautiful things that he said was I love coming here because I'm accepted for what I am and who I am and no one's judging me and he said that's really rare. The bands were better. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. No, there's some really great bands around now, but there was there seemed to be a lot more freedom. I mean, that's when I got introduced to the likes of the Dead Sea and um, Angel Head and all the kind of progressive noise bands. And I hadn't really, because I'd been involved more with the Bird Nest Roy's types for the poppy songy songs, and um, so those bands really kind of opened it up for everyone and made, made us all realise that within a group like Chickendale House you could actually do whatever you wanted. The best memory is just being able to play some of the most sort of you know, hated music on the planet <laughs> there to an appreciative audience of three or four at, in the early days. I mean it was one of the only venues that would have some pretty extreme music that we were involved with. As to the quality of work in those sorts of, sorts of places, it varies massively from pretty appalling to brilliant. Um, and the good thing is there was some performance art there as well and a few other more interesting and odd things. So it's certainly, I mean, it survived for so long, which is amazing in itself, you know. Um, so it must have been working. Um, and a lot of people put a lot of energy into it. Uh, so. Yeah, it was just an all-round good thing.
So good to have such a big crowd. Loving it here in Dunedin. At the Dunedin Public Art Gallery. Fanu is the main key thing. Nobody had any reservations about who anyone was or everyone just worked together really well and that was I think that was one of the things that really excited me about the place because no one really particularly knew everyone that came in, but everyone just worked together, planned together, and and accomplished together, much like on a marae. Yeah. And by the way, you don't get to walk into the marae without going to the kitchen, and Chippendale House was very much like that. You did get to sweep the floor. You didn't just get to perform. <laughs> it was a good time. 
actually. It was quite hard, you know. There was very little money. I mean, there were times there where um, there was no money, I can remember, you know. Basically, flats had nothing in them but tea bags. And um, one night we even just decided we had to go and find some money and stepped outside our Liverpool Street flat and then found 20 bucks in the gutter. So we went and got fish and chips, but it was, it was that close, you know. Nobody had cars, and of course there was no cell phones. It was all word of mouth or posters or um, ringing people up or going to see them. Walking, a lot of walking. I remember a lot of walking. Just trying to make the best of what we had, really. As a music community of, you know, always slightly left field of centre, it was phenomenal to have the support of other people. And it's the first time, you know, I'd, I'd been playing sort of mainstreamish music with other people a little bit up till then, and it was a whole, whole different world, and it was just totally liberating, and the power of musical community is what I, to this day, is still really strong. That was by far the most important sort of time of realisation of that, and the most potent realisation of that that I've ever been involved with. We were very lucky to have been there in that time, in that place. It was amazing.
Thank you very much, Janine Public Artillery. Thank you, Janine. Thank you for our friends. Thank you to the people filming. Thank you, Scott. Thank the world that we're alive. Thank you. We live in such a beautiful country. Thank you very, very much for being here. Bye-bye.